So if you guys can, turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy 2. Oh, yeah, you guys are spoiled. You guys have shame, so you have your own Bibles. Look, flip up the desk, see if there's a Bible in there. You guys need Bibles. Especially you, Logan. I know you're not smart enough to just know the Bible at the top of your head. Two twenty-two. So, Marcus, you want to read that one little verse once everyone gets there? Second Timothy two twenty-two. Really? It's a good verse. All right, Marcus, read it for us, brother. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of your heart. Amen. Okay, so since we already prayed, thanks to Raymond's amazing prayer, uh, we're going to, I want to, the title of this is called Running Away from Our Sin. Um, a lot of us, we have, we all sin, obviously. It's common sense at this point. We all struggle with sin, but some of us stay with our sin. I kind of take sin as a, I kind of compare it to an abusive relationship. Um, because sin will destroy you. Sin will make you feel miserable. And Satan, and sin will possibly lead you to do things that can harm you permanently, like suicide and stuff. Sin can lead you to do a lot of things. So, it's like an abusive relationship. Non-believers and Christians struggle with this. Notice how I said Christians, because even when you're saved, you still struggle with sin. See, we find pleasure in, in this sin. Instead of doing what the Bible says, we just shrug it off and continue in our ways. So I want to start this message off with a question. What sin or sins have control in your life? What sins are controlling you on a day-to-day -day basis? And you're at the point now where you're like, well, no one knows about it, so I guess it's okay to do it. Or, you know, everyone else is doing it, so it makes it okay to do it. And, you know, maybe it's make, leading you down the path of where you're starting to get down on yourself and everything like that. Because the reason why I'm saying get down and all this miserable stuff is because when I was deep, dark in sin, I knew what it did to me. And I remember just time and time again laying in my bed just pondering whether or not if I should commit suicide or not. Whether or not if life is really worth living anymore. Because I was in a lot of sin. You wouldn't believe how much sin I was. I was never in drugs or anything like that, but I was, you know, listening to music that literally worshiped Satan. I was cussing a lot. I was watching things I shouldn't have been watching. It was just really terrible stuff in my life that was controlling me that I figured, you know, no one knows about it or other people do it. So what's so wrong about it? And later down the road, it became to the fact where it started tearing down my life little by little. And, you know, of course, my mom with the cancer situation, which gave it more fuel to the fire and which kept bringing me down even more. So another question is, are you running away from these sins or are you holding back? Are you just letting it control you and abuse you and making you feel like you're not worth anything or just miserable? So I'm going to give you three points tonight. And the first one is running from, second point is running to, and the third is running with. So the first point comes from the first part of 2 Timothy 2.22. It says, flee also youthful lusts. So in Paul's last letter, he talked about running away from sin. We happen to live in a world of sin. This, of course, doesn't mean it's okay. We as Christians should run away from sin. Why? Because as I said earlier in the introduction, sin leads to the path of destruction. And Matthew 7.13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Notice that quote right there in Matthew chapter 5. It says, or chapter 7, it says, Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. So if you don't know what a broad path is, it's basically a super wide path. All right? It has a lot of space, and uh, it'd probably be like this room. You know, it's really broad, it's really open, to just get rid of the desk. But it's a nice open space where you can walk through. The passage is mainly talking about salvation, eternal separation from God, but we can make it into the center. Okay, we look at sin and we, and we see it and we're like, okay, Satan is tempting us here. As we see in Genesis, when he uh, goes to tempt Eve, he tempts her through the eyes, he tempts her through confusion, and making it seem like it's okay. Now, Eve could have went the hard, the narrow way and, been, and fight off the temptation, but instead she went the broader way, the easier way, and just did the temptation and did the sin. Many times today, we, we come to that realization, you know, New Year's resolutions. I'm going to stop doing this that's bad in my life because it's wrong. 
maybe for about two to three weeks, you're doing great, and then somewhere down the road, you start doing it again. And then you're right back to where you were on New Year's. That's just a silly illustration. But as you can see, you went the easy route by saying, you know what, this is too hard to beat off this one sin. I'm just going to go this, take the broad way again. But notice how it says, it is the path that leadeth to destruction. It doesn't say, well, if you enter into the gate of the broad path, you know, everything's going to be fine. You just went the easy route. No, it says, it will lead to destruction. So, let's say, let's talk to the Christians real quick. Christians are called to do things. That might not just be ministry purposes, but it could be, you know, God may be calling you to be something else in life, some, some kind of job field that he wants you to be in. So, <clears throat> we know what the Bible says. We know what God wants us to do some point down in our life if we're in his word. And let's just say, um, let's just make a silly illustration again and compare things. Say Marcus is called to be in the mission field, okay? God calls him to be a missionary to China. And he gets a job offer from um, this one place that says, we'll pay you this amount. But Marcus knows that's not what he's called to do. And let's say that job offer is something ungodly, kind of let's say, oh, let's say a politician. And uh, he, you know, he's doing it just for the money, he's doing it for the wrong purposes, uh, deceiving people, trying to get them to vote for him. And, um, and we real, and, but he knows what he was called to do the whole time, that was to go on the mission field. We see Marcus went the broader path because the position was open to him, it was more money, it was, it was way easier than being on the mission field, going to China and getting paid very little money and trying to get churches to support you. So Marcus decides, hey, you know what? I'm most, he's most likely going to choose the politician route. So James 4, 17 says, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. So Marcus knew what he had to do. He knew what he was called to do and he knew what was right and wrong. But he decided to do what was wrong, which makes it sin. Many times today, you know it's wrong to cuss, you know it's wrong to do a lot of things that you do, but instead you look at it and you're like, ah, who cares, and you could do it anyways, and you sin. And there's gonna be a time in your life when you're gonna to come to the realization that what you have been doing has been no good for you this whole time, and in fact has been destroying you. And that's why it's like an abusive relationship. We see times in marriages, the husband comes home drunk and beats on his wife. And most of the time, relationships like that, you go to the woman who decided to marry him. A lot of times the man she knew was not saved. She knew he had nothing to do with God. And she's a Christian and she knows what God wants. And maybe that wasn't the man God wanted her to be with. But, you know, he calls her beautiful, he calls her this, he calls her that, and she fell in love. And she goes with him. You can see she took the easier route instead of waiting for God and she took the first opportunity. Her sin destroyed her. Instead of waiting on God, she went with a man who had nothing to do with God, lived an ungodly lifestyle, and she got beat for it. Because the man had nothing to do with God, he decided to do his own sin. And of course, that affected her and her marriage. But there is a choice that she has in this, and just to let you know, I do not support divorce, unless it's for certain reasons, and that is, she has a, she has a choice to run away from that sin. You have a choice to run away from your sin or whatever it can be. You have the choice. Now, whether or not you're going to do it or not is the big thing. No one says it's easy to run away from sin. When I was about, I'll say about 15, and uh, I was in a really dark time in my life, and uh, many of you in here know Jake. He came to me and he started talking to me about it, and, and he recommended me go talk to John. It's kind of funny how this is kind of role reversal between me and John, but you know, I, I look back on it and it was rough trying to change, trying to run away from my sin. The first month, you know, I knew what I had to do. I had, the, I had everything planned out of how I was going to do it. I was in this a lot, I was in prayer a lot, but the temptations were still there. And to the point, because see, Satan isn't going to let you just get away. He's going to try everything he can to keep tearing you down and to the point where you just give up on life. And he knew that God was working in my heart and trying to get me, and God was molding in me and making me to the pers person that he wanted to be. And I believe that he did it because we look at the time that the church is going through right now. 
that um, he has put me in this position to speak to you guys and to speak to the adults on Wednesday nights. Now let's, now let's take a look at this. If I were decided to take the broader route, and that is to continue doing my sin, and you know, keep missing church every Wednesday and Sunday, and if I do show up, I look at John and be like, just hurry up and shut up and finish your message, then I wouldn't be here right now, and I don't know how the youth group would be. I don't know where Raymond would probably be the one speaking to you guys right now. And that's it. You guys don't want that. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> but, but you see, through my decisions of getting right and running away from my sin, God has been able to mold me and make me to where I am today. I have been able to help many of my friends who have struggled with the same things I have struggled. I have been able to witness to people. I have been able to help people with their lives because God has molded me and made me the way that he wants me to be. And if I never have decided to run from my sin, who knows where I'll be in life. I'll be somewhere probably that I don't even want to think of where I would be. But let's say that you want to run from your sin. But where do you run to? Where do you run to? Where, where do you go to get away from this? Well, the second part of 2 Timothy 2.22 says, says, But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. So, if we fall on the righteousness path, we can see it's going to be a lot more narrow than a broad path, but it's the right path because, like I said, Matthew 7.14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. We can see if we run to the narrow path, we can see it leads to a happier life. And, you know, I just told my testimony a little bit, and we can see through me running to this narrow path, and let me, let me just say something right now, the narrow path isn't easy. The narrow path is a lot harder to walk because you're going to be walking in and there, and let's, let's imagine a path real quick, all right? Here's a narrow path. It's just this little space, and there's holes, there's ditches, there's obstacles coming out in front of you, and you're doing everything you can to stay on this narrow path and to continue pushing forward to that gate that leads you to life and to lead you to, a, to, a perfect, to an amazing relationship with God to where God will be able to use you and be able to ha give you countless of blessings that you can ever think of. But somewhere along the line, when you're on this narrow path and you're walking in it and you're running to it, you're going to know th there's going to be something that's going to happen. You're going to probably fall. Okay? You're going to fall in one of those ditches. You're going to either probably hit your head on one of the obstacles or something and fall down. Which is important because God's there to pick you back up, which we're going to get into the other point. But all because you're walking a narrow path, don't think right when you fall, it's over. You're back on the broad path. You know, you're going back on the way of destruction. No, 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 no. It is your, it is your um, job to realize, look, I fell. Call upon the name of the Lord and he will pick you back up. He will do it. There was, there was countless of times in my life when I was walking, or, and still today, Still today, I'll be walking this narrow path, and there'll be times in my life where I'll catch myself falling. Because I'm not perfect. I have a fleshly nature. I'm not perfect at all. But there's times where I'll be just call upon the name of the Lord, and He'll pick me back up. He says, get back to work and finish the job that I have you to do. So you've now just ran away from your abusive relationship. You start realizing you're getting happier as you walk down this narrow path, because you're realizing, hey, you know, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm actually beating the stuff that was pushing me down, and now you're being uplifted. And you know, the great thing about this is not only when you start changing your life to be a better person, people are going to realize it. I remember my friend Dylan, when I first started changing, he thought, you know, like, well, what's going on? And I told him what happened. And this led me to a way of witnessing to him, because Dylan is not a saved person. He's, a, he's an atheist. He has nothing to do with God. In fact, he actually hates God. But he saw what God was doing in my life, and he goes up and asks, he's like, so what happened? And I told him. I was able to witness to him about three or four times, and he believed what I was saying because there was living proof that God changes people that call upon him, that allow him to mold and shape you into the way and the person that he wants you to be. But to do that, you have to stay on that narrow path. You can't jump off of it, get back on that broader path, and start going back to the path of destruction. You have to walk the narrow. There's going to be people in your life that are going to try to bring you down, which brings us to the third point which is, who are you running with? We look today in many Christians' lives, they have friends. And a lot of times they're not godly friends. And those are mostly the friends that are going to try everything they can, unintentionally of course, bring them down and bring them back onto their path, which is the broader path. 
they're going to do everything they can. Which, when you're, and here's what 2 Timothy 2.22 says. It says, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You need to have friends who are godly. You need to have friends who will be able to uplift and encourage you daily to be with God. Where are you at, Chris? Where are you at in your Bible reading? Oh, I'm here. Okay, good. Those are the type of friends that you need. And I'm, and I'm glad to have some of those in my life. Without them, I could probably still be down, knocked down on the ground asking for people to help me up. Because yes, the Lord will help you up, but you also have friends, godly friends, that are there to help you back up and encourage you when times get even more rough than what they are. I'm going to pick on Logan now. Logan decides to get on a narrow path, and he's doing great. Well, let's just say one of his friends, say Logan used to be a huge druggie, okay? He was into cocaine and meth, and he was just this big, huge drug person, okay? Okay. <laughs> we don't need to call out people, Michael, okay? Goodness, man. I know Logan is struggling with it, but he'll get through it sooner or later. But you can see he's going to be, he's walking this path, and he's beating that abusive relationship that he was in, and he's running away from it, but he has a friend who's going to try to bring him back into it unevent unintentionally. Logan's going to be asked, hey, man, do you, you want to go to the back and just, you know, maybe one more, one more time, man, for good time's sake, to do drugs with me? Uh, I don't know. Come on, man. Come on, Logan. Just one more hit. Come on, man. Logan does it. Next thing you know, he's back doing what he wanted to get away from. Because it's so easy for friends to influence you to get back on their path. And now, of course, they don't mean this. Well, maybe some of them do. But a lot of the times, they don't mean to bring you back to the wrong path. But see, sin blinds people. And in Romans chapter 1, um, I preached on it before, God gives over to those who he has tried to get their attention many upon countless of times, get their attention on the fact, hey, look, you either accept me or that's it. And you'll be working in that unsafe person's life countless upon times. And then finally God says, okay, that's it. And he gives them over to a reprobate mindset. So maybe Logan's friend has this reprobate mindset and he doesn't see what he's doing is actually wrong. And Logan falls back on that path that he was trying to avoid. It is important to run with those who are willing to help you along. Let's say Logan never had that friend. Let's say he had Raymond. Okay, Raymond was his friend. And, and Logan saying, says to him, look, man, I'm really struggling with this. And Raymond's there like, hey, man, look, don't do it. Don't do it, man. He's like, look, this is what you need to be in. You need to be in prayer. Stay busy with God, and you'll have no time for the things of the world. And that's what's helped me in my life. I find myself, if I keep busy with the things of God, I have no time for the things of the world. You know where I'm at most of the time in my life? Here. Right here in this church. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, sometimes Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays. I'm here. I'm here doing whatever needs to be done. That's preaching to you guys, or just coming to church to hear pastor preach, or that is to help pastor out, you know, like this room right here is to be full of junk, full of books, and those things over there, cabinets, and I picked them all up basically and moved them into that room. I was here at the church doing the things that I knew was right. I didn't have time to go and, you know, maybe do something I wasn't supposed to do. I didn't have time to, you know, let's say, possibly, even though I never did drugs, you know, have the urge to do it. I never had the time to do any of this stuff because I was here doing the things of God instead of the things of the world. So we see in Matthew 14 about the godly friend that we need to have, okay? And this is a very familiar story in the Bible, but it's a, it has a lot of truth in it. And that is in Matthew 14, where is it? Matthew 14, 29 through 32, it says this, verse, or, verse 29. Like, why is my notes all messed up? Okay. Okay, verse 29, it said, And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And verse 30 says, But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith. The winds, and he, he picked, like, you know, he picked, Paul up, Peter up, when he was sinking in the water, okay? He just immediately, Jesus stretched down his hand, picked him up, and led him back to the boat and said, O oh, thou little face, where is thou thou? And when they were come out into... So we can illustrate the story into this. 
the water that Peter was walking on is a narrow path. Okay? And in this narrow path, you know, everything is rough. The ground, like I said, is rough, has like holes and ditches in it. There's obstacles everywhere that can knock them down. And it's just a very violent path. And Peter gets on this path and he sees how rough and intimidating the path is and he falls. Okay? He just he loses sight of the, of the things of God and he falls. And when he falls, notice Peter's reaction to this. He called on Jesus. He didn't wait till he was all the way at the bottom of the sea, going, boo, 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 you know, no. He, right when he started sinking, he said, God, help me, I'm about to sink. And God, without hesitation, didn't say, well, you know, you know, I told you to keep looking at me. You know, what are you doing? Oh, you're going down further. Well, I'm, you want me to help you? Eh, I don't know. No, God immediately went, what are you doing, Peter? That's, that's, the, that's the thing that we need to focus on. When we're on this narrow path, we're going to fall. Like I said, we're going to fall countless upon countless of times. But how far are you willing to fall until you call upon Jesus? How far are you willing to fall? Are you going to be like Peter and do the right thing and call upon him right when you realize you're starting to sink? Or are you going to wait until you're all the way down at the bottom where you just were and then say, God, pick me back up, please, and go through the whole process that you just went through? See, people use that story as a way to diss Peter and saying that he had little faith. But we could also give Peter credit because he didn't wait till he was all the way down drowning and basically dead until he called upon Jesus. He waited while he was still perfectly alive and breathing and just fell a little bit and said, God, help me back up. So, we could see in 2 Corinthians 6.14 about the friends that we need to have. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath right, righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion have life with darkness? So these unbelievers that Paul is talking about here cause also, could also be believers of Christ. We're going to touch on this a little bit. There, there's Christians out there who are willing to seem like they're walking the narrow path with you. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, keep, keep doing the good things. Keep doing the good things. But as you focus, but as, as you're doing that, little do you know they're going to start saying, Oh, you're going to church? Why, why, not, why not just, you know, skip church this one week, man, and let's go out and do something fun? Oh, you, you want to, you're, you're preaching. Oh, well, that, I guess that's good. He's like, so what made you decide to do that? Um, are you sure you want to go to church today? Are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to go to the church and help? Are you sure you want to go to that Bible study? You don't really need to go to it. You know, you could just stay home or something like that or go over to my house and we could chill or something. And next thing you know, you realize they start dragging you down. I have a friend who, uh, who's a Christian who, is, who I realize unintentionally started dragging me down their path. Um, of course, I, I called upon God to help me before things got too bad. But, um, you know, me and him were like this. You know, we're like brothers. And uh, he's a Christian. And we're, and he was in, sitting right where Gabby's sitting, right there. He was right there. And I can remember getting done preaching a message, and he, called, and he says, Chris, can we talk? And I said, sure, let's go ahead and talk. And he decided to get things right with God. But he did it all for the wrong reasons. He did it so he could get back with, this, with a certain person, and, not, and he didn't do it for himself. So while I'm trying to help him stay on the narrow path, he starts doing things again, like drugs. He starts hanging out with friends that are leading him to doing drugs. He's cussing. He's doing things that he's not supposed to do with other women. And as I'm trying to help him, I realize my language is starting to get kind of bad. I realize I'm starting to have urges that I didn't have for a while. And I just realize he's unintentionally dragging me along with him. And there had been a point in time where I said, OK, I need to stop. I need to cut this off. Because 2 Corinthians 6.14 has truth. See, what it means by being unequally yoked, see, back in those days, they had a yoke. And what that would be is they'll, they'll have two cows, big, huge cows, and they'll have this thing put on their neck, and they'll be walking and plowing the fields with the farmer. But if they put a big, huge cow here, and then they put a little goat down here, what do you think that little goat's going to do? He's going to be getting dragged with that cow behind and getting hurt. So that was me. I was that little goat. 
with that big, huge cow. Christians, you will always be the little goat in an unequally yoked situation. You're never going to have more influence than those who are not on the right path. You know why? Because it's a wider path to walk and it's easier to fall than to stay back up on your feet. So let's go ahead and conclude this and we'll be done for tonight. And the thing is, Christians, don't stay in this abusive relationship they have with your sin. Don't get rid of it. Start running to the narrow path Run to the things of Jesus and run with those who are willing to encourage you and help you to stay on that path and live a godly life. It's, it's time to stop allowing sin to claim victory in your life and stepping over you and saying, see, I beat you again. I beat you again. You're nothing more than just a worthless human being who just keeps falling to me all the time. You need to stop letting it claim victory in your life and, and having it withhold the blessings of God from your life. But you need to instead run and like I said, run with those who will help you so you can beat sin and claim victory in your life where you will be able to do God's will and be able to experience God's blessings in your life. Bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to have a little bit of invitation here. I'm going to ask a question here to those of you who are Christians. How many of you here can say, Chris, listen, my life isn't godly. You know, I call myself a Christian, but in reality... I'm living like the world, and I'm saying the honor of God, and I have sins in my life that are tearing me down, and I need to run away from How many of you in here can say, Chris, that's me? Don't be shy. You know, God, if God has a hold of your heart, don't, don't throw him off. Like I preached to the adults last, uh, last week, I preached about God getting your attention. Don't shrug it off. He's going to keep chastising you until you wake up. Now I'm going to talk to the unbelievers. There is any in here. How many of you here can say, Chris, I'm that unbeliever where I always allow sin to win because I don't really believe in the things of God, but I feel something grabbing a hold of my heart tonight, Chris, and I don't know what it is. Let me tell you something. That's God trying to get a hold of you and trying to say, accept me into your heart. Change your life around tonight and start living to the things of God and not of the world anymore, so you could actually live a happy life. And not only that, but live eternally with the one who made you and not burn in hell for the rest of your life if you die. Don't put it off, because you don't know what life holds. Life is like a vapor. It snaps like that. And if you die here, and if you die you know, on your way home from church, and you're not saved, in hell you're going to be thinking, God tried to get my attention by saying, look, time to get saved. Because God knew what was going to happen. So how many of you can say, Chris, God's called me for salvation tonight? How many of you can here say that? Raise your hand for me. Okay. So we're going to dismiss in a word of prayer. And I just want you guys to know, listen, I'm here for you. Raymond's here for you. Naomi's here for you. And if there's anything that you need to talk about or discuss, just grab a hold of us after the prayer. We'll be willing, we'll be glad to talk to you. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day, and thank you for allowing me to preach again, God. And God, I just pray that you use this message, and you work it in the hearts of the teens in here tonight, God. And God, we know that there is a sin in our life that always will be holding us down. But God, just let us be able to claim victory over it, and to run from it, God, and run to you, and, and run with you, God, so we could beat it, and never let it bother us again, because we're with you, God. God, I pray if there is someone in here that is not saved, that you'll be able to grab a hold of their heart tonight and where they will not be able to sleep tonight until they come to the conclusion that they need you, that they need you in their life and they, that they need a Savior, God. God, we thank you for all the things that you do, God, and, and uh, God, just help and just uh, answer the prayers of the prayer requests that we had tonight, God. And God, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.